next week. We'll come to that in a minute. I'll go through the details of how we're thinking about the budget. I also want to talk about four other issues that are priorities that were outlined in the early perspectives from the governor around housing as an extremely important issue, education and workforce development, helping enhance and utilize the economic development tools that the state has and some new ones that are made available to us. And then finally, talk about how we ensure that the investments that we're making are available and targeted to help improve the performance of the state government. So let me talk about the first one on the next page about budget resiliency. Um, as we all know, we're in hopefully not the end of, but at the long part of an economic recovery. In fact, the longest one since, since World War II. We hope that keeps going, but economic cycles are what they are. And we have a budget and a state uh, fiscal situation that is highly dependent on and volatile relative to that economy. So we want to ensure that the budget that we have is resilient through both these good times that we're in now and the inevitable downturn. So as you can see, we are reinforcing the efforts to ensure that we have as robust a reserve as possible. There are a continued expansion of the rainy day fund. There are an additional $4.8 billion dedicated to paying down un underfunded retirement liabilities and other past obligations. And the budget itself is built on conservative economic assumptions. The Department of Finance continues to model under different scenarios. This, this case is one that's conservative, a moderate growth over the next forecast period of about 3% per year. But with these sorts of reserves, we're in a position to try and ensure that when the inevitable downturn comes, we're in a position to, to weather it as best we can. I say that first and foremost because the economy is volatile in the state of California. Our budget is very volatile, and we want to continue to reinforce that budget stability and resiliency through cycles, an important element of economic growth in the state. The second topic I want to talk about is we happen to be in a relatively robust budget environment. So the investments that were made as part of that budget process were all oriented around trying to restore the California dream or renew it, particularly focused on the number one issue that a number of people have continued, including the summit, to talk about is our challenge with the cost and affordability and accessibility of housing. Uh, major investment, $1.3 billion out of the general fund as one time new approach for, for our housing, new housing developments, part of the governor's Marshall Plan for Housing, where he took the California Economic Summit's million home challenge and said, that's not big enough, we'll make it three and a half million, and he's serious about it. So there is a major investment in within the general fund, but there's an important and to be discussed much more going forward, effort to link housing funding with transportation priorities. So obviously, as all of you know, linked very tightly in terms of how the economy works, we're gonna make that linkage in terms of funding even closer so that housing investments come before housing, before transportation funding comes or come in parallel. Also expanded the state housing tax credit programs and have reached out to the private and philanthropic sector to match the investment that we're doing. And you saw a major announcement late last week from, among others, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to help reinforce the importance of different types of capital, not just state capital and private capital will be necessary to ensure that we build the housing and make it affordable at the scale we need. The second major investment in the budget was around broadly education workforce development and encouraging incentives for people to work and enter the workforce. So you saw a continued expansion of funding of K-12 through Prop 98, including uh, not just K-12, but community college at an all-time high, recognizing there's still more investment needed, but we are fully funding on Prop 98, what's, what is allocated to K-12 and community college. We added another 1.4 billion to higher education beyond community college to encourage enrollment and completion and to ensure that tuition is reasonable cost for those students who are participating in those systems. Also allocated funding to ensure that the importance of the California Community College isn't constrained by people's ability to pay tuition. So allocating enough money to ensure that the first two years of community college are tuition free. And finally, a dramatic expansion, continued expansion of what we're now calling the California Working Families Tax Credit, the EITC, one of the best known tools to ensure 
that those who are entering the workforce or have or have families that are struggling to make men's meet have tax incentives to, to supplement that and are encouraged to work. We're very excited about the success of that program to date and are expanding it and hope for even more dramatic signups in the next year. On the next page, the other elements of what are important in the early days of the new administration is that we really want to help encourage the continued use and further development of the economic development tools that we have. Uh, the budget, as you saw, encourages the continued formation and expansion of the enhanced infrastructure financing districts and includes proposing removing the 55% voter approval uh, requirement to, to uh, approve those. And we are going to be dramatically encouraging and reinforcing the new federal program of opportunity zones that you are all familiar with, particularly looking to pair those with the districts that are enhanced infrastructure financing districts and help align both private, public, and other capital incentive programs to ensure that given what we're trying to do in terms of directing investment to parts of the state that need it the most, and in particular investing it in affordable housing, and an attractive, uh, green-oriented, and job-creating programs in those parts of the state have the kind of resources and an investment that they need. And then finally, uh, in terms of things that I think are important from an economic development frame, is there is a couple of investments that are important in terms of improving the state's government's performance. One of those is the a specific funding for a longitudinal data system to track student outcomes all the way from birth through workforce. And secondly, a startup allocation to establish a Office of Digital Innovation, which will help bring underneath the government operations agency new kinds of talent to complement those existing state government to encourage the most more efficient and aggressive use of the latest digital and innovation tools. So those are elements of that I think are important to reinforce in the budget. Obviously, budgets are statement of priorities, and this one is a statement of the priorities that are important to the governor, which are very much, I think, aligned with the priorities that are important to ensure that the California economy works for all. Go on to the, to the next page. Beyond the budget, the priorities that I see for our office and more broadly in my role advising the governor's team on economic development are built on ensuring that we have an upward economy for all, an economy that enables the California dream to work for everyone and that economic mobility is not just a promise, but something that we're deliver against. So the sets of things that I think we'll be talking a lot more about and over the next while here are really focusing on enabling sustainable economic growth statewide. So those are important words that I know are familiar to the California Economic Summit around triple bottom line orientation of the kind of growth we want. We just don't want narrow short-term corporate profits or things that are not attractive for the environment or things that don't encourage broadly based economic mobility and success. Secondly, as we talked about, there are elements of it in the budget, but more broadly, ensuring that the costs of healthcare and the costs of housing are brought in line so that we are not constrained in terms of trying to ensure businesses and, and our workforce can afford to live here and, and have an attractive life. Third, as we all know, California is at the forefront of both technology and globalization and promoting California's brand, our activity, our innovation, our people more broadly around the world, ensuring that we are open to talent, we're open to capital, we are promoting the great great activity that occurs here more broadly. It's gonna be an important part of what we do. Regions rising together will be again, familiar theme for this group. Uh, this is not an economic development approach that starts in Sacramento and is, is pushed down. It is one that is region based and up. And connecting those regions, whether it's central California to the Bay Area, the Inland Empire to Southern California, San Diego across the border, ensuring that the eastern and northern parts of the state are as attractively capturing opportunities in the booming economy as the coasts. Those are important elements of what we'll be talking about. And the last two things that you'll be hearing more about is around ensuring that we are deploying all kinds of capital to encourage the kind of economic development we want. There's obviously funding from the state, but that's a small piece of the overall pie that will include 
ensuring that we're drawing and accessing all federal government funding that's available, but importantly, tapping private capital and the large pools of philanthropic capital that are available here. Many of the investments that are needed work much better if there's a fully blended approach to those to that capital deployed that both brings government, private, and philanthropic capital to make the whole capital stack work. And then finally, if you have had conversations as any part of either employer groups or the economic summit more broadly over the last several years, workforce issues and ensuring that we have the kind of investments and skills that we need to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to participate in the economy that is in front of us is going to be a really important part of what we're doing going forward. You saw the investments in higher post-secondary education. You saw an investment. The best way to have people ready and prepared to do post-secondary education is to invest very early. It was a major investment in early childhood activity as well. And then finally, I don't think we're in an era anymore where you could learn everything you need to know in your 20s and earn for the rest of your life. I think it's going to be much more a continuous process of lifelong learning and helping people imagine and reimagine what they are throughout their life and being excited about the opportunity to learn throughout your career and do that both in formal educational settings, but also through a much more broad use of apprenticeships, through time employer training programs and the sets of things that ensure that the workforce has the kind of skills that the uh, business environment will require going forward. On the next page, I want to talk finally about how we work together. Um, you, you might have seen that in the announcement of, of the office and my role that we will be establishing a Governor's Council of Economic Advisors soon, an external group of advisors who are helping the governor and, our, and the agencies ensure that we are tapping the best minds and the best ideas and stress testing the sets of ideas that are at the forefront of the economy. The way I think about that is with the fifth largest economy in the world, we need to have the kind of world-class external economic advice that an economy that size anywhere else in the world will. So speaking more from that from us shortly. That group will help tackle some of the tough, long-standing issues facing the state, providing independent advice and counsel on those. Things like how do we deal with the revenue volatility that we talked about earlier in the state's budget? How do we think about and encourage and measure and incent economic mobility? for all of Californians? How do we think about the geographic and economic and uh, the geographic and demographic dispersity and disparities across the state in terms of how that mobility is happening and what can we do about that? And then thinking more fundamentally about the changing nature of work, not just how do we have a workforce that's able to meet the needs of today's employers, but as we think about the impact of technology coming forward, artificial intelligence, robotics, increased global competition, what does that mean to the nature of work and how do we prepare for those? So they're just some of the issues that we expect will be coming forward and uh, put forward to the Council of Economic Advisors to help develop an external perspective that will guide state policy on those issues. So as you can see, there's a pretty broad array of things that we're going to be focusing on over the next while here. Uh, how do we accomplish this? First and foremost, you, as you would imagine, we're going to be basing our policy and our delivery of these objectives based on evidence. So this is going to be an, an effort to ensure that we are capturing data, ensuring that, that there's something that works somewhere in the state or outside the state or even outside the country that works. We want to know about it and base what it is that we do based on the evidence of what's working. That means we'll expand what's working and we'll stop what's not working. So evidence-based policy. Secondly, we really do want to lab, leverage the laboratories of democracy. That's a uh, Louis Brandeis terms about the states as being laboratories of democracy. The state of California is as large as most countries, so we want to leverage the laboratories that are happening across the state. So looking at ideas that are happening in regions, things that are working on in different counties and different cities and different school districts, and trying to figure out how do we make those not isolated examples of laboratories but innovation labs that can then be scaled. That means that we're going to have to really have an approach as the summit does, which is a very open approach, one that's cross-sector, cross-geographic networks. We're not going to be talking about a centralized approach to economic development. It's going to be a open, cross-sectoral, geographic, dispersed, bottoms-up process for economic development. And then finally, as Jim said in the introduction, um, we have challenges facing this state. 
And we want to make sure that our solutions get to scale at the pace that the problems are occurring. So really trying to ensure that we're learning what's working and what's not, and then rapidly deploying to ensure that what is working gets as fast as possible to scale, to nature, to uh, focus on the nature of the challenges facing the state as rich and as interesting as the state of California. So none of this, if you have participated in the economic summit or heard me talk about any of these issues before should come as surprises to you. These are things that the summit has helped put forward over the last several years as issues and approaches that would be appropriate for the nature of the state of California. And we really look forward to continuing the collaboration to ensure that all those great ideas get implemented and they get implemented with the pace and speed and scale to meet the challenges and opportunities of this great state of California to ensure that we have a California dream that works for everyone. So with that, let me stop. I will put on the last page as we're looking at the questions that we have coming in, how to get in touch with me or with Chris. That's our email address. Um, feel free to send us ideas, send us uh, comments, uh, send us criticisms if you think we're not doing something that we should be doing or there's something that we are not doing that we should be doing. And in particular, we look forward to an ongoing partnership to do as best we can to address the challenges. So with that, why don't we? Why don't I stop and open it up to uh, to questions? Well, thanks, Lenny. That is um, terrific. It's um, very ambitious. I'm I'm sure a lot of uh, Californians, and especially those that have been involved in um, the summit's activities and through the regional organizations, are ecstatic by the comprehensive nature and the value base and uh, the focus on the on the primary drivers. Uh, both for the challenges we've got and where we know the solutions lie. And so I know that they're going to want to take you up on your offer to partner in every way uh, possible. Um, give us some sense of, you know, one of the challenges that um, you didn't address specifically, but it's always there, is the perception, if not some variation of reality, that uh, California can be a hard place to do business. Costs can be expensive. Um, all of our important um, protections of one kind or another create layers of regulatory obligations um, for small businesses as well as big businesses. And so from uh, your position in this office, how are you thinking about um, as we do these big initiatives around housing and workforce and the future of work, that we also are, are rethinking, reengineering um, the integration of, of, of those activities in ways that are as efficient and, and productive as possible? Sure. Um, so uh, first of all, California is an expensive place to do business. And so we shouldn't um, try and hide that fact. It is true. Then uh, there are elements of that that are things that we can and should address. One of the most important reasons that California is an expensive place to do business is because it costs so much to live here. Um, until we have a housing supply that meets the demand for our workforce, it's going to be more expensive than it needs to be. And so the first thing I would say is when you, I was at a series of meetings over the last 24 hours, and when you ask people in a wide variety of industries, what is it that concerns them the most? It's their ability to attract and retain people. And when they, when you ask them, so why is that? They say it's because it costs too much to live here. People really would like to be here and work, but they can't afford to live by a home or even pay rent. And they can make it work for a few years and then decide that it's just not possible. So the first thing I'd say is that's why housing is such a high priority is we have to ensure that people can afford to live here. Secondly, there are things that we have as a state made a conscious choice that are priorities for us that will continue to be. And so it's one thing to say we're, the answer to that is lower your environmental standards or lower your labor expectations or lower the standards for the, uh, what it means to be a responsible citizen, and we're not going to do that. And so what we do want to do is ensure that those are done as efficiently as possible. And so thinking about ways to streamline processes to keep a high road view about what the objective is, but make the process of engaging with regulatory agencies or across agencies or across levels of government as effective and efficient as possible. Um, you will see some things as part of the housing initiatives, for example, that will try and help speed the process of approval and building, particularly in high priority areas and opportunity zones and where EIFDs are. I think you will see efforts to try and 
on high priority uh, pain points for regulatory costs and burdens that are unnecessary to meet the objectives of high road standards, but are just because of you know, complexity or overlap. And I think we will take some runs at those. That takes work and it's not something that you should expect is gonna happen overnight, but we are gonna put an effort underway across the, the different parts of the state government and then through that leverage, their interaction with the counties and cities to try and make processes that are important but unnecessarily complex, simpler and cleaner. So tools like Lean and Six Sigma, tools around um, ensuring that processes are designed around citizen and customer experiences, whether that is a citizen as an individual or customers that are business. Thinking about how do you make those work, I think are processes that are, and tools that are utilized in other parts of the economy and are used in some parts of the state that we wanna, we wanna put some effort against. So that's, that's a, a short version of what we should expect going forward. That's exciting. Um, Lenny, the flip side of that is that um, you're right, all of these initiatives are important, whether they're around environmental protection and climate change or whether they're around uh, uh, re reducing poverty and growing business. Um, and it seems like there, there may be some opportunities for really lining up those initiatives so you get the triple bottom line benefits and you've indicated an interest of the administration of really leaning in on things like opportunity zones. And I'm curious if, uh, 24 hours into this, whether you have opportunity, where you're seeing opportunities, um, not just to align uh, the efficiency of government, but to really um, align the ambition of government in order to create triple bottom line solutions where in the, where in the past some of these initiatives were um, valid and important, but single bottom line oriented. Um, so um, yes, is the short answer. We do see opportunities where I think the nearest term focus will be and where we can definitely use support and help is around leveraging the full potential of opportunity zones. Um, as you all know, that was a federal government program that was a bipartisan program to ensure that there are in the up to 25% of zip codes in the state designated areas that need, uh, that are low moderate income and need more investment. They are designated and investments in those zones that are properly um, set up have the opportunity for some substantial capital gain taxes uh, deferment or even total uh, avoidance um, we think that is a really really important opportunity to do redevelopment in areas in the state that need it now to make that work we have to not only have the kinds of designation of the zones which the state has done a very good job of identifying the specific ones but ensuring that there are investment ready opportunities in each of those areas not just housing but job creating early stage capital and ideas and opportunities that help encourage investment in job creating clean energy and, and new sorts of uh, opportunities in those geographies. And that the other investment tools that we mentioned earlier, enhanced infrastructure financing districts, other government programs, incentives, both at the state, local and federal level, private capital and philanthropic capital come together to support those. Now that is a, a mouthful and not that simple to do, but we really want to ensure that whatever it is that the state can do to align what we do to make that happen, we want to do, including tax alignment. And we want to ensure that there is transparency of reporting of the social impact of those investments, because what we don't want to do is have large investment in some geographies that result in gentrification and people having being forced out of those geographies. So we do want to have uh, discipline around the investments, both in terms of economic returns, but social returns as well. And then finally, we're going to need help in ensuring that those are investment ready. They're part of the opportunity is to have more capital focused on parts of the state that haven't had as much attention in terms of deal flow, haven't had as much technical support to this and assistance to ensure that what's necessary to make pro projects investment ready are there. Um, that is true in every part of the state. It's true particularly in parts of the state that haven't benefited from the economic boom. And it's true even in some big portions of our major metropolitan areas that haven't had that focus as well. So I think there's a big opportunity there, not to use the pun about opportunity zones, but that's something that we're going to need some help on in making that real. It's a time limited opportunity. So the faster and sooner we get capital deployed, the better off we'll all be. That's a great example. 
Honey, I think we have some questions coming in here that, that you can probably see better than I can. Okay. Um, one of the questions was, will we send the presentation? And the answer to that is yes. It will be up on our website as soon as we figure out how to get it up there. So that's uh, available to everyone. <clears throat> There's another question about how do we see the role of California universities for le leveraging the, the intellectual resources as laboratories of democracy for the future of work? Um, that's a great question, and you put three of my favorite phrases together. Um, I do think the one of the secret sauces and the crown jewels of the state of California has been our substantial investment in post-secondary education. The, the, community colleges, the CSU, the University of California system, and our private universities. A lot of times the bulk of that attention is, talk, is focused on the student element of that, which is extraordinarily important. It's where uh, the opportunity for everyone in the state of California to get post-secondary education happens, and, it, and we have a substantial investment to ensure that's true. But they are also, in addition to the human capital that comes through those systems, a huge support for uh, research. The California's both university system research labs, the national labs that are here, the private university, private uh, sector labs are extraordinarily important for the ongoing innovation of the state and the intellectual capital. It's necessary to ensure that we're in the best place going forward. So I think there is an opportunity both to reinforce the investment in those institutions there's an importance to highlight their role in the ongoing success of the state of California, the economic impact, the economic mobility impact. I think there's a real important opportunity to make much more transparent what is available within those institutions that can be applied to existing problems. And then finally, I think there's an opportunity to ensure that we've got whatever we need to ensure that what is available there turns from ideas to products and tools to broad social impact, particularly those that benefit the state of California as rapidly as possible. So I was at an earlier meeting today with the California, the CCST talking about this with a group of, of uh, lab leaders and industry leaders who are really interested in ensuring that science and technology are an important part of ongoing California success. And I don't think we should take this for granted either. Um, we have had an advantage of being one of the places in the world where that research started. We had major investment from the private sector and from the federal government for decades, but we're not alone in that. There are other states, and importantly, there are other countries in the world that are doing that, and if we uh, take that for granted, that's a huge problem. So uh, I think uh, all of those things are, are part of how we invest to ensure that we've got economic opportunities that are continuing to be on the leading edge of innovation. And much of that happens in our terrific research institutions in the state. Um, there's another question about how and when will we select the advisory council? I think that question is about the, the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. We hope to announce it very soon. I don't have a specific date on that, but within the next few weeks, we'll be announcing and standing up that, that uh, council, which will be charged with addressing some of those longer term fundamental issues that I mentioned. Um, questions around industries that California should invest in to promote economic growth over a 20 year period. Um, so uh, the short answer to that is that's for the private sector to figure out. And what our job is to help ensure that what is necessary to ensure they succeed, that the state has a role in, that we're part of it, that if we have barriers that are preventing that from happening, that we remove them. And that if there are things that the state can play an important role in catalyzing that we think about that. But I'm, I'm not gonna be in the business of predicting what those industries are. I will be in the business of listening to what different regions and different people who are investing in industries of the future think and what we can do to help ensure that whatever the state can do to help accelerate that, that, that we're part of that. Um, there's a set of questions around um, facilitating international investment in California and how does Southern California figure into those plans? So as I mentioned um, uh, during the talk, there, the California has and continues to be on the forefront of technology and global integration with the world, particularly as 
it relates to, not solely, but particularly as it relates to, to Asia. Um, there is um, an important part of that, which is flows of people, ideas, technology, and goods, and ensuring that those flows are as accessible as possible both ways, so that there's, to the extent there is interest in foreign investment in the state of California, that we are removing barriers and helping encouraging that, to the extent that it is flow of goods and ideas and people from here and, and outside of California both ways, we want to encourage that. Um, we want to ensure that things like goods movement don't get in the way of that. Um, and obviously in all of those, Southern California is an extremely important part of that equation. It's obviously the largest part of the state, the ports are essential, the connection to the goods movement uh, uh, system is essential. So I just think that it, you can't have that conversation around global integration without talking about the whole of the state. And you certainly can't talk about it without spending a lot of time thinking about Southern California and everything that's there. Um, the question about a region's first approach, and are we going to be strengthening the department, strengthening the on-the-ground representation around the state with representatives that are aligned with regional strategies? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, there is uh, already some of our members of this department, as well as other members of the state of California that are not in Sacramento. I think that's really important. I think it's particularly important in parts of the state that have not had much, as much connection with, uh, with uh, the rest of the state. The governor announced through his uh, activity and up through and to his inauguration that we will we'll be opening a physical presence in the Central Valley, and we will be doing that. Um, I think that's essentially you can't have a view that your region's regionally oriented without being connected to the regions. So uh, I welcome any other thoughts and ideas on that. It's, it's, I wouldn't expect to see massive state investment in opening physical presences around the state. What we want to be leveraging is existing activity and things that we can partner with to ensure that we're connecting with the important activity that's happened in regions around the state. Um, so there were a question. I can't see the full question. The, uh, in the Bay Area, Oh, on how, fill in housing. Sorry, let me move back up. Uh, so the question around infill housing options and how do we have avenues to incentivize that approach? Uh, it is an important part of the discussion around linking transportation to housing, meeting housing needs. It's also an important part of the discussion around how we ensure we leverage enhanced infrastructure financing districts and opportunity zones to do that. What we don't want to be doing when we're talking about a Marshall Plan for housing <coughs> is, is uh, cementing over large parts of green space and thinking about a much more sprawled element of how we produce housing. There, and California Forward has been part of this analysis of understanding what is already zoned for housing but not been built. And a large portion of that will be in infill housing around transit hubs. Not all of it, but an important part of it. And so to the extent that the state can incent that through linking transportation funding to encouraging the tax incentives and other incentives that come from EIFDs or opportunity zones, that will be part of that. And then finally, I do think there is an opportunity to encourage cities and counties and planning commissions who are part of the process of approving those to understand why that's in their economic interest to do that and in their citizens' needs. Um, there, it's a big challenge that you all know, if anyone who's dealt with housing, thinking about how you ensure that you have the housing we need and ensuring that it is in the places that it should be is not a simple matter, but it's a big priority. You can't address the issue around housing costs without having more housing built in places where the urban infrastructure is already built out. And that includes things like accessory dwelling units, not necessarily just big new construction, but it also encourages the preservation of existing facilities and encouragement and, and utilization of homes that are often um, people who have, have lived in a home for a very long time and have extra space and would like to do something with it. And so that's where things like ADUs can play an important part. Um, the question around 
uh, opportunity zones to be aligned with federal benefits for housing and green technology. Uh, what's the definition of green technology? Uh, the specific components of how the uh, opportunity zones legislation and regulation will be articulated in California what we're going to be developing over the next short while here. So the honest answer is we don't have a precise definition yet, but we will and can certainly use thoughts and perspectives on that. But what I will say is that the administration is deeply committed to ensuring that capital gains that are generated in the state of California that could be deployed in opportunity zones in the state of California are deployed in California. What we don't want to have happen is all this great capital gains and innovation that's happening in California create opportunities for investment and all that investment happening someplace else in the country. So we are going to help ensure that that stays here. But we do want to as well ensure that the, that investment happens, happens in investment priorities. So that's what the geographic zones are. And to ensure that they are invested in areas that are aligned with the economic priorities of the state. So that includes affordable housing, includes investments to ensure that we have the climate objectives that are really important for the state met. And it also will include encouraging kind of job creation of good jobs and jobs that have career opportunities for people, particularly in those parts of the state that haven't had that much investment to ensure that. So we will be specifying all that in the next while here, including what the requirements are to ensure that the alignment with the federal tax codes happen for the state tax codes, and expect that there will be expectations for reporting back on those matters. So it's one thing to say, yes, we are gonna do that. And it's another thing to say, there's an expectation that if you're getting those tax benefits, you're gonna be reporting back on what's the job creation, what's the housing production, what's the opportunity to reduce carbon, what's the new innovation and workforce opportunities. Those are things that I expect that you'll see more from us on how we do that. And we welcome input on guidance on that. Um, there are a few places in the country that have the opportunity to think about their state tax code as being aligned with that, that will set the standards for what opportunity zones are around the country and California's at the forefront of that. So we wanna get this right. Um, so I'm reading some other questions as, as long as I can get my eyes to focus on that tiny print. Um, how do we balance climate goals and CEQA requirements with the goal of new housing? Will we see a fix for CEQA paired with the focus on connecting housing and transportation? That is a terrific question. Um, one of the important elements to ensure that we meet our housing needs, but do it in a way that is triple bottom line oriented around affordable and focused on continuing to meet our climate goals is that that housing has to be produced and developed both in terms of how it's built and where it's built in ways that reduce our carbon footprint rather than expanding it. So that's an element of why I said we don't want more urban sprawl. We don't want activity that really paves over the important elements of agriculture and the green space that are so valuable in the state. It also requires that if it's a priority investment, that we help ensure that the regulatory requirements that are necessary to get that built are as efficient as possible. Obviously, um, not just CEQA, but other elements in the, the approval process um, are important in that. And so thinking about, particularly in those investment priorities, that we do everything we can to streamline that is gonna be one of the things that we are paying attention to. How exactly that occurs is something that we're still working on. I don't expect to see any lowering of environmental standards expect that we're keeping an existing environmental standards and our goals that we've set for carbon reduction. That doesn't mean that that needs to take 10 years to build a project. If we're if particularly in things like opportunity zones where you've got a fixed timeline within which you can build and have take advantage of those tax opportunities, that doesn't do any good if it takes 10 years to build a project. So thinking about ways that we can speed the time from approval to people moving in is something that we'll be spending some time and could use your help in thinking about how exactly we do that. Um, so I'm moving down to other questions. Are we planning any changes to the department and its current role in state government? And do you feel that any of the incentives or other programs that promote should be expanded or scaled back? Uh, a number of different examples in, in, that, uh, in that opportunity. So the, the uh, answer to that is um, I'm 24 hours into the role. And we'll be taking a good hard look with our team about, as I said, if you're going to be evidence-based, that means you look at what works and expand them. 
and you look at what doesn't work and pair them back. And so I don't have a, a specific answer for you on that. We will be taking a hard look at everything that we do and ensure that it delivers. And if there's more opportunity, we will make the case for expanding them. And if it's not working, we will either fix it or stop it. So I don't know at the specific level what that looks like, but I do think there's opportunities. There's some great capabilities and tools within the agency that I think have a substantial opportunity for expansion. And there's some of them that we'll probably have to take a hard look at in terms of the state investment in them and the kind of yield that we get from them and, and decide whether that can be better deployed someplace else. Uh, and finally, I would say the definition of what I'm intending to do is not defined narrowly to what's within this agency. So a lot of these activities are going to require cross-agency coordination, and that's why there's an important role as the uh, economic and business advisor for the governor and thinking about how to connect with other agencies and between the state government and, and different levels of government that will be a part of what we do. Um, so there's a good question that I should have uh, uh, answered from the beginning, and, and it's a little bit of what we've talked about in the history of the California Economic Summit that's just become a phrase that we use all the time around triple bottom line. And what does that mean? Um, in this context, what we mean by triple bottom line is that it's economically successful, that it's environmentally successful, and that it's equity successful. So that it is good investments in economic growth are those which grow the economy, grow it in a way which is good for the environment, and grow it in a way that helps encourage economic mobility and equity. And so that is very much how I think about the role of what economic development and business success in the state should be. I don't think of the role of this department, this agency as being business promotion narrowly. I think about it as economic success broadly. And that's both good business and it's good long-term thinking about how we ensure the economic success of the state of California. So thank you for asking that question. We'll be more precise in defining what that means. But um, you know that uh, highly successful long-term oriented businesses operate that way already. And so we want to encourage more of that. Um, if you really are in business for the long term, you don't do that to maximize your short term profits at the sake of long term performance. You don't do that in a way which spoils the environment in which you operate. And you do that in a way which ensures that the people who work with you and the communities that you're in are successful as well. That's just smart business. And that's what when we think about California economic development, that's what we mean. That's what the triple bottom line is. Is that a fair answer, Jim? It's a great answer. <laughs> Um, so can you roll up one more? Mm -hmm. When do we expect to see the details and eligibility criteria for opportunity zones, especially as it relates to green technology? Um, the next few months, we expect that to be out and um, in, in a position to ensure that the investments that are necessary and have to happen quickly are ready and available for investment. So expect that to happen pretty quickly. Um, what role do we see the regions engaged with the California Stewardship Network playing in your organization? Um, as I mentioned, the economic development and strategy for the state is really a regionally oriented one that aggregates up. And so the mindset and leadership and history that the California Stewardship Network has played in terms of embedding that mindset within the regions and connecting the regions is very much the way we want to operate. So I think they're the members of the California Stewardship Network, regional organizations that have been focused on delivering this triple bottom line activity are going to be fundamental to what we do. Um, the opportunity to ensure that those regions are having activities that are appropriate for the region. It's a very different economy in different parts of the state. Um, and ensuring that the, the activity that occur in the regions meet what those regions' needs are, but are also connected to the other regions as appropriate, and ensure that that aggregates up to things that the state should be doing. That's the approach we're gonna try and take. So I think the efforts of being steward leaders across the regions are really, really fundamental to the operating model. Okay, can you talk about how the state agencies will seeking opportunities to collaborate on addressing issues that impact across diverse interests, addressing climate change impacts to business growth. Um, so I, I think I know what that question means. Let me try. Um, the part of that has to do with 
thinking about what the fundamental objectives are and ensuring that to the extent they are intersecting with different agencies that were aligned around that and, and delivering against that objective as opposed to the narrow definition of what specific agencies have. So a good example of that would be if you really believe we need more housing production to ensure that people can afford to live here, but you need to do that in a way that's environmentally sensitive, that only happens if you have cross-agency coordination. So you know, you, you, I don't think you can tackle that issue generically. You have to tackle it in terms of area by area and ensure that that's successful. Another example in a very different realm might be the recently legalized and uh, important for the future industry of, of California that's cannabis. Thinking about how that's done in a way that is um, meets the regulatory objectives, ensure that it's safe and not available to those who shouldn't have it, but and it is uh, uh, it, we can trace where the product's coming from, but done in a way that is encouraging attractive economic development for the industry here, not just for big players, but for everyone. That's an important part of you have to do that on a cross agency basis. So I use those two examples not to be the only ones, but those are very different types of challenges to think about how you integrate and work across agencies. So we've got about three more minutes for questions. So I'll try and tackle a couple of these and then encourage you to send questions into Chris or me on the email and we'll certainly be get, getting back to you. And as I said, don't think of this as a one-time, one-way dialogue, a one-way monologue. I really do expect this to be an on di ongoing dialogue with all of you. So let me try and answer a couple of questions and then close. Um, any suggestion about how rural regions in the state can actively engage? Uh, I think that's a, a terrific question. And as many of you know, um, I grew up in a rural part of the state and still have a family farm in Turlock. And I feel that as much of my home as where I live in Silicon Valley today or where I work in Sacramento. So this is personal and visceral to me in addition to being an economic priority for the state. It has been uh, relatively easy to uh, be thrilled about the economic success of the coasts of California, the coast of California, and not pay attention to the other parts of the state, whether it's Central Valley, the Inland Empire, parts of the urban footprint, the east, the north part of California that haven't been, have benefited from that. Um, that's been an important part of the economic summit from the beginning from my standpoint the efforts to ensure rural California succeeds, the efforts to think about how we um, deal with the extremely damaging effects of the wildfires and the ongoing impact that could have in a way that's just not ensuring we are recovering from them, but using it as an economic and workforce opportunity in rural and, and uh, northern parts of the state. I think those are important, important opportunities for us. I'm also going to be looking to folks like those on the call in the California Economic Summit for ideas about how we do that. This is, is not something that is uh, simple to do, nor is it something that we have the answers fully about how to do that, but we're very interested in, in ideas about how we ensure that all of California benefits. Um, so I think I have time for, for one last question, which is um, a rant from asking about California manufacturers who face a challenge with recruiting and retaining skilled workforce and how do we intend to uh, interact with industrial trade, skilled group workers, skill equipped workers and others who are necessary for um, those industries. Um, I'd say a, a couple of things. Number one, uh, every industry in the state and it's particularly acute for some of those that have had uh, ongoing skills gaps have workforce development at the top of their list of the things that we want to focus on. It is something that is one of those issues that it is a good, another good example of things that aren't within a specific agency or a specific narrow interest. If we're going to make that work, which we will, it's going to take engagement with the workforce system in the state. It's going to take involvement with the educational system in the state, and it's going to take engagement with employers in the state. And so uh, trying to ensure that those are connected around ensuring that we have the workforce that we need and that is tailored to the specific workforce needs of a region and done in a way that is fluid and reflective of the fact that those workforce needs are going to evolve over time is a big challenge. I'd say one thing that I would pay attention to, and we certainly are going to be talking a lot more about this and can use some help on, 
is we're big fans, and I'm a big fan of a dramatic expansion of apprenticeships as part of the solution set. It is done right. It's a really effective way to ensure that the skills that are being developed are relevant because you're learning them on the job and that they're connected to the education institutions, the workforce, and that employers have skin in the game to make that happen. So the governor in his campaign activity talked about dramatically expanding the apprenticeship programs. That's really important for skills-based activities, but it's much broader, broader opportunity than just, just uh, that. So thank you for the questions. So Lenny, in the 30 seconds we have left, um, you have a really nice house in Half Moon Bay and you have a brewery in Half Moon Bay, and you were um, nicely retired at a young age doing exactly what you wanted to do. So why is this important for you to do this at this point in your life? Um, so I still think I'm a young age. <laughs> um, no, listen, I'm a big believer that when you're called to public service, the answer is yes and how, not, not no or I can't. And so when asked, that's what you do. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm a product of California. I, I come from immigrant family on one side and from those who came from the Dust Bowl to California on the other side. I believe in the California dream and to the extent that there's an opportunity to help ensure that dream's available for my kids, my grandkids, and my neighbors and their kids and grandkids, I want to do that. And so the answer is how can you say no? And if you ask the people on the webinar, they'll give you the same answer. And that's great. And I really look forward to all of your help in ensuring this, this California dream can continue. So thank you all for spending some time with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jim.